Patrick is a, is a professor in uh, the Department of Soil and Crop Science at Colorado State University in the US. And he's currently, I mean, spending a spat sabbatical in different places and, and he's been uh, with us at IFRISAT for, for the past months. And so there at Colorado State, he teaches and conducts research on plant breeding, genetics, and biotech. Uh, and his uh, research focus on applying quantity Disease resistance in dry bean and seed yield in canola. So he has been involved in a number of projects uh, to evaluate the benefits and risk of genetically engineered crops. So if you've got any any queries on, on, on GMO, you can ask maybe. <laughs> and prior to joining uh, Colorado State, he has uh, had a, I mean, a number of experience outside uh, the U.S. Spent ten years more or less uh, in agriculture development agencies in Nepal. The Cap Verde Island, uh, west of, uh, of uh, Western Africa, and then in Mexico at, at Semiti, as I understand. So, Patrick, you are going to be talking about improving drought tolerance in wheat in the semi arid US, Great Plains. Over to you. Huh? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to say how grateful I am to Vincent and his group for hosting me. It's been a real pleasure. And to all of you at ICRASAT, um, you talk about the ICRASAT family, and my wife and I have really felt welcome. So thank you very much. Um, this uh, initial slide is just to give you an idea of why we're interested in drought tolerance in Colorado. This is the most recent version of the US drought monitor map, where essentially everything that's not white indicates some type of moisture stress. Um, my part of the country, um, is right here. And so good shares of Colorado are currently in these scary sounding terms like severe drought, extreme drought, exceptional drought. These are areas that are important for crop production. Most of the wheat, the winter wheat at least, takes place in this belt, which are those shades of red and brown. So it really is serious. And this is coming on top of 2012, which was a serious drought year. So um, climate change deniers are having a hard time, <laughs> uh, you know, on top of things like this, as well as hurricanes and other extreme events. So it's something we really need to start paying attention to. So we've been involved in a number of aspects of drought tolerance. These are some of them. Uh, I'd like to say something about the wheat growing environment in Colorado. Um, our attempts to use wild relatives for enhancing drought tolerance. Something about canopy spectral reflectance as a phenotyping method. Genetically engineered risk assessment. And then finally, a little, little bit about soil microbial associations. So this is the normal moisture pattern in Colorado, well, in, in the US, with this very regular series of, of um, bands. As you go west, it gets drier. So that in our area, uh, most of our winter wheat production is in areas between 380 and 500 millimeters of rain. Now, last week, your DG talked about the dry, dry regions you're targeting and, and the wet, dry, with 500 millimeters as some kind of dividing point. Well, unfortunately, we're mostly in the dry, dry. So uh, this is really uh, semi-arid and similar to environments you work on in some ways. This is a diagram of how winter wheat grows in Colorado. Planting is in the fall. Uh, crop gets established to the three or four leaf stage, goes in, into a dormancy period, and then late February, March starts growing. You get this stem elongation phase of rapid growth. Heading takes place in mid to late May, 
uh, harvest late June and early July. So it's really a long crop. It's in the ground for uh, a good nine months. What are the key stages? Well, um, I'll just tell you a little bit of what I'll say later, and that this stage is extremely important. Having good uh, plant establishment in the fall so that the crown and the root tissue gets developed before the cold period, and then stem elongation phase in the spring. So March and April rainfall. We thought we should take advantage of a lot of the historical data that's available. So we access data up to 100 years in some places for weather variables and yield estimates. We looked at five different counties from south to north. South tends to be drier and warmer, and it tends to be a little wetter and cooler in the north. These are uh, values for one of those counties where the rainfall really does in some ways match the development of the wheat crop so that we get good rainfall typically on average in uh, the fall, September, October, around planting time, a uh, little rainfall during the winter, and then picking up again March and April. But there's a lot of variability, as you're all familiar with, that averages don't happen every year. And so this is showing the number of years, this is out of 100 years, where we get very low rainfall. And so maybe uh, 30 or so years out of the 100 would be considered deficient of planting, and maybe about the same for the stem elongation phase. So we did uh, some simple regressions, just looking at rainfall over different periods of time related to the yield estimates for a particular county. And I know this is pretty simple compared to the more sophisticated modeling you did, but I think it gave us a good indication of, of what are the key developmental stages. So October precipitation, this is a the slope of that regression. And maybe this is the most interesting value to look at, the R squared. So October pre precipitation accounted for 20% of the variation at harvest. Well, that's pretty important. January precipitation, not quite so important. But in this case, uh, January in our environment, Precipitation is likely to be snow rather than rain. So the importance here is not so much the moisture itself, but the protective effect of having cover, which reduces evaporation. And then April precipitation, also a 20% factor. So those were some of the very important uh, variables. We also looked at temperature and found that temperature in May. This is um, just before and including anthesis. And uh, this is just another way of expressing that same thing, before and after heading was also important. But really, it was the moisture rather than temperature, which are important in our environments. So our conclusions were that precipitation was more important than temperature, that uh, the fall, winter, and March, April, periods are extremely important. Uh, high temperature, important around heading. This is nothing new, but it, it uh, confirmed what has been shown elsewhere. And we found that the weather variables were more important in the south, which tends to be hotter and drier and more variable than the north. So what does this mean for breeding? Well, one thing it got us thinking about is how can we get better stand establishment? And something that's been looked at in wheat is the long coleoptile trait. Um, this is a photo of Richard Richards in Australia who's worked with this. This is the long coleoptile wheat compared to a conventional wheat. So with 
this long coleoptera, you could plant the seeds deeper. You could plant where you're more likely to encounter moisture in the, the soil environment and still get germination. Whereas if this one was planted that deep, it just would never emerge. So that's one thing to look at. Another is uh, tolerance to low moisture stress during stem elongation. And I'm not sure what a specific trait it would be, but at least it gives us an idea when we're trying to impose a moisture stress, this is what we should target in our greenhouse and uh, field studies. Now, an interesting question would be, how useful would alternative forms of reduced height or semi-dwarfing alleles be? Uh, traditionally, or, or at least in the last uh, 40 years or so, RHT1 and 2 are used to reduce height. And those are some of the green re revolution genes. But they also uh, have this shorter coleoptera. So what we and others are looking at is if we can get the benefits of height reduction while retaining the long coleoptera. And there's some indication that some of these novel alleles will do that. OK, I'd like to move into this idea of using wild relatives for improving wheat performance. And of course, to you at ICRISAT, this is not a new idea. You've used wild relatives in, for a lot of your crops. But the idea is basically, can we get something useful out of this deployed scrawny looking plant here that would improve uh, performance of hexaploid wheat? This is a figure, maybe you've seen this from a, what I consider a very influential paper by Tanksley and McCooch in 1997, indicating the allelic richness by the, all these different colors in the wild species, reduction of that through this bottleneck at, through early domestication, and then uh, further reduction as we get into modern varieties. And so the use of wild species is to try to uh, test or sample again that broader allelic diversity. So in the case of wheat, um, the, the evolution is pretty well known, that there was a hybridization between two diploid species, having the A and the B genomes, giving rise to the progenitor of durum wheat that we use for pasta. And then some of these plants hybridizing with Agelops tausii, the D genome donor, to give the hex hexaploid ABD. Now it's considered because the ranges of these species don't overlap very much that this last hybridization involved a very restricted amount of germplasm, so a very restricted amount of the diversity present in Tauchia. So the concept of synthetic hexaploids, it's a way of recreating what happened in evolution. So manually crossing tetraploid weeds, AB weeds, with uh, Agelops tausii, but using a much broader range of tausii germplasm. The benefit of putting this into a hexaploid background is that then you can cross with wheat without all the barriers to having different ploidy levels. Simit has taken a real lead in developing these. They've developed over 1,000 now. And we evaluated over 400 of these in a dry land site uh, shown here. Most of them were really pretty awful looking. Um, you know, maybe that's what you would expect with uh, a third wild germplasm. But we were able to identify a few that had high productivity based on biomass, that were more wheat-like in their appearance that had seeds which were not shriveled, but looked pretty decent. So it was a pretty hard selection, but we uh, uh, chose six, eventually ended up using five of those. Uh, this is a side view and overhead view of two of the synthetics we chose to use. 
and uh, this is currently the most popular variety in Colorado called Hatcher. Um, so compared to Hatcher, these don't have nearly the density of spikes or the, the size of the spikes or the seed, but they're reasonably looking. They would be identifiable as wheat. So we, this was our crossing scheme. We chose two cultivars, one from uh, Colorado, one from Nebraska. Cross those to the synthetics to develop the F1, and then back crossed to the cultivar. Again, so we ended up with BC1 F1 families. Um, so these would have about three quarters adapted material, 25% of the synthetic. So the first thing we had to do with these was select for winter habit because um, the synthetics are all spring habit and spring is a dominant trait. So we selected for winter habit and then uh, yield tested 159 of the F2 families from here. We did that in eight environments. Uh, this is a picture of one of those. We're fortunate to have a USDA site nearby that has uh, acres of drip irrigation. So we were able to have side-by-side -side irrigated and um, non-irrigated trials. Um, you might be able to see a little bit of difference. This is the non-irrigated, this is border row, and this is irrigated. So we ended up with quite a difference. Uh, grad student taking notes on uh, many traits. So these are a portion of our results. This is grain yield of the families expressed as percent of the parental cultivar grown in the same experiment. This is a dry treatment. So for good streak, the mean of the families of each of these synthetics was um, you know, relatively low compared to the cultivar. Within these families, there were at least some that were equal to, but maybe not anything to get too excited about. With Hatcher, it's a different story. The mean of the families were pretty close to the cultivar, and then the range for each of the synthetic families was 20% or greater, so some significant amount of improvement. For the wet treatment, not as good. Um, maybe for good streak, the results are comparable, uh, somewhat poorer. And for Hatcher as well, there's a couple of families that did pretty well for some of the synthetics. But in any case, it was really the, the dry rain-fed environment that we were most interested in. So it did correspond to our expectation and our hope that we would get alleles from these synthetics that would help help performance in the dry environment. So like I say, the results were at least moderately encouraging. In each location and most populations, at least one family was better than the parent. Yield advantage was greater in dry environments. Uh, hatcher crosses were better than the good streak. but and this is an uh, important, um, uh, important factor that occurs in many of our yield trials. The genotype by environment was significant. So the families that did exceptionally well under dry were not necessarily the ones that also did well under wet environments. So we're still uh, selecting and testing. We made selections within each of the most promising families made BC2 crosses, and we'll be evaluating those this summer. OK, we also looked at these cultivars and synthetics in a root tube system. And if this looks at least vaguely familiar, it's because I was inspired by meeting Vincent at the last interdrought meeting in China and seeing about what he does. And so we developed this. Yep an array of 120 tubes 
um, I guess one way it's different than Vincent's work is that we use a medium, it's called fritted clay. It's very uniform. It's about the texture of sand. It's used in uh, sporting fields for good drainage. But it works very well in this situation because you can very cleanly and easily separate the roots. And so here's some examples of that. And you can see that there's very uh, significant differences among the biomass in this case. So we scanned the roots. We, we divided the roots into uh, top, middle, and bottom thirds of those tubes. We scanned on Winrizo. I know some of you have done that same work. And we um, analyzed for different diameter classes, so five different uh, diameters of roots. And what this is showing is for the three depths and for the five classes of root size from top to bottom, whether the tolerant or the sensitive limes, genotypes, have, um, have more root length. Okay. So in this case, out of 10 genotypes, they kind of broke into three groups, um, tolerant and sensitive with three each. So that this is what this is comparing. Now, these aren't necessarily synthetics versus cultivars, because both synthetics and cultivars occurred in both of these groups. Okay. But this is tolerant and sensitive based on relative water content. And what you can see, for example, is um, in this middle third that the sensitive group had a longer length of the, the thickest roots. But the tolerant group had a much longer length of, of the finer roots. And that same thing is shown in the bottom. Okay, So maybe it's not surprising. The ones with the better water status were the ones with deeper roots and finer roots to, uh, uh, to help their water uptake. OK, so I'm kind of jumping from topic to topic, but this uh, now we're getting into canopy spectral reflectance, which is one of those techniques that's being promoted in uh, many places as a high throughput phenotyping method. Um, most of the work we do in drought tolerance and much of what uh, Vincent and his people do here is very time consuming. It takes time. It, it's hard to do a large number of genotypes. What we would really like is to be able to look at hundreds of genotypes uniformly in as close, um, uh, as reduced amount of time as possible. So what's shown here is the idea that you can uh, have a tracker, tractor mounted spectra, spectrometer, or uh, all, there's also handheld models, which will reflect a certain portion of the visible and near infrared spectrum um, shown here in the spectra. Um, there are different types of devices, some at a very few restricted wavelengths, and many of them across a whole band, so that you get uh, thousands of data points for each uh, sampling point in the field. The idea is then, based on different mathematical indexes among these absorbance values, that you can measure things like the amount of radiation intercepted and correlate this with biomass, water content, chlorophyll, et cetera. So it sounds great. Um, especially the fact that with a tractor, at least, you could get through the field pretty quickly. Um, how useful is it going to be? Well, this was our implementation of it. We bought a handheld instrument called a Jazz. Uh, this is the uh, controller here connected to sensors, which are placed over uh, a field plot. The pro problem we had with the device was that this would heat up. Now, unfortunately, the company packaged it 
in a, a black case, and the instrument itself is black, so not exactly great for keeping cool. We ended up having to put this into a, an ice pack, just to try to keep it cool in the field. Um, and it took time. We couldn't just get a reading in a millisecond. It took um, 20 to 30 seconds to get each reading. Well, that slows things down because we wanted to get more than one reading at each point. Others have been able to implement something like that in a scanning type of mode where you can just walk at a reasonable pace and click a button and uh, get the readings. Our device has proved difficult in that way. But this is um, a picture of what we got for three varieties in uh, a wet and a dry treatment uh, with the letters indicating significant differences. So at least we were able, based on these spectra, to separate wet and dry. Now, the wavelengths that are recommended, often used for water status, are 900 and 970 nanometers. So we get sample this plateau stage and then this dip in reflectance down here. So we could separate more or less the wet and the dry, and at least one of the varieties was distinct from the other two. Now, interestingly, well, we, we our, our main goal was to use this in an association mapping panel of 300 cultivars laid out like this. And we sampled starting here and went down and then back up, et cetera. When we looked at the data, we had two normal distributions. And we ch when we checked where these outliers came from, it was very curious. There were all over here. So they were the ones last measured during the day. So I think this just emphasizes the point that when you do something like this, you really need to restrict the timing to as much as you can because these were sampled over uh, four and a half hours. And I think really uh, two to three hours is what we need to be shooting for. So I don't know if it was something about the angle of the sun or the instrument had just heated up too much. But um, it certainly points at um, ways we need to refine our technique. Anyway, when we did get this data, and uh, we calculated different indices, but all using those same wavelengths, we found they were essentially the same. They were uh, very highly correlated. Correlation was with grain weight. Um, minus 0.35. Well, nothing to get too excited about. Actually, I was kind of excited that we, we got something this high. I wasn't expecting that for our first year of working with this, we would get um, this type of correlation. Others in the literature have reported things like minus 0.7, uh, maybe even higher, you know, which gets into the range that you would think, yeah, this is pretty useful. Uh, anyway, we did get something, and we need to keep working to make that higher than it is. OK, risk assessment. Um, there are a number of private companies that have entered our part of the country recently for wheat, uh, all, all the big names in uh, multinational seed. And they're saying that they want to introduce, at some point in the future, genetically engineered wheat, including for drought tolerance. Well, that could be a real boon for farmers to uh, overcome the limitation of water. But it also raises a red flag, because we have a wild relative of wheat. It's an invasive species introduced from Eurasia called jointed goat grass. And you can see. In this picture, here's the goat grass, the wheat, and the hybrid really does look like an F1 hybrid between those. It's intermediate in uh, morphology and size. And these are things that are seen in the field 
with regularity, so we know that they happen. So in risk assessment vocabulary, there are things called exposure and hazard, where risk is the product of those two factors, exposure being the frequency of an event. In this case, what's the frequency of wheat by goat grass crosses and stable introgression of wheat germplasm into goat grass. And then the hazard would be, so what? What is the potential impact if that does happen? So we tried to look at both of those. We were very fortunate that in um, 2003, there was a new variety released in Colorado called Above. And that's a herbicide tolerant, a clear field technology, if you're familiar with that, which is herbicide tolerant, but not transgenic. It was developed by mutation breeding. But it's a single gene trait, and it uh, worked very well for us as a traceable um, gene flow trait. So this um, really became a good opportunity to look particularly at landscape level gene flow. You know, most gene flow work is done in small plots in experiment stations. Um, could be very different than what happens when a farmer is planting 50 or 100 acres of a crop. So in this case, we found, we made lots of phone calls, we found situations where the above variety was planted side by side with a herbicide sensitive variety. And then we sampled from um, the herbicide sensitive variety at regular distances up to 60 meters with the idea of testing the seed harvested here to see if there was any indication of having received the herbicide tolerant pollen. Okay, so, so a lot of sites, a lot of seeds. We had acres and acres of these planted out. But, um, oh, first let me show this. Another way we did this and that is done in gene flow work is called a Nelder wheel, where a central point is uh, planted to the indicator trait and then surrounded by the uh, receptor varieties. So this square here is the above variety. The red shaft and white shaft strips are two different sensitive varieties. And I love this picture because you can see exactly what we did. We sampled in transects in all directions. We took one meter square uh, cuts of all the wheat in that area. And I did that on all sides of the field and then planted these out and looked for any indication of herbicide tolerance. OK, here's the reason this system worked, is that if something is completely susceptible and you spray with the herbicide, you get a dead plant. That's pretty obvious. If it's something resistant, it's uh, nice and healthy and vigorous. The heterozygous condition had a really distinct phenotype. It was stunted, twisted. Uh, the spike had a very uh, definite morphology. So this is what we were looking for. We planted all these hundreds of thousands of seeds. We, plant, we sprayed with the herbicide a couple of times. And then we went back and counted how many of these, because those would have been the plants that received pollen from the tolerant variety. Uh, this is shown on wheat or goat grass. It was a similar phenotype that we looked for. Uh, we were able to verify our suspect uh, goat grass plants based on chromosome numbers because we would expect in this cross between uh, tetraploid, which is uh, the goat grass and the hexaploid wheat, uh, pentaploid. So we would expect 35 chromosomes. And so we were able to do that just as a way of checking on our uh, classification. 
So here's a summary of the data for two years for various sites, uh, the number of plants screened. This is uh, goatgrass now, not wheat. Uh, the number of hybrid plants we found and the uh, percent cross-pollination. So uh, overall, 0.1%. Um, not terribly high, but at least in one sample, up to 1.6%. Um, so uh, a big variety, a big range of things that can happen. But considering that goatgrass infest hundreds of thousands of acres in the Great Plains, you don't need a high frequency. You know, this uh, uh, 0 0.10 could still represent some significant amount of cross-pollination. But really, it's the next stage that's important, not just this initial hybridization, but is the gene, are, are all the, are these F1 plants back crossed them to go grass? So what we did in this case was to plant F1 plants, which are indicated by the red flags, surrounded them with a planting of goat grass, harvested the spikes, germinated them, and when we got a germinated plant, that would indicate that back crossing had taken place because the F1s are male sterile. Okay, so only the pollen from the goat grass plants could have pollinated uh, in order to get the seed. Okay, here's graphs of two locations where um, the number of hybrid plants is here on the x-axis. So, um, yeah, the number of hybrids that were tested and then the frequency of back cross plants. So most of our values were zero. Didn't see any indication of back crossing, but we did see the similar curve in both cases. The mean again, or the median, was about 0.1%. So low for the initial stage, low for the back crossing stage. Um, so you could say the, 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 the risk of back crossing. is pretty low, um, but what is an acceptable risk? I mean, that's something that really the risk um, managers need to determine. How about the impact of a drought tolerance transgene? What would happen if that transgene did get into um, goat grass? back crossed was selected in favor, would we get one of these so-called super weeds that started invading even new territory? Um, well, we didn't want to actually transform goat grass. It would be very difficult and maybe even irresponsible to do that. So what we did is to assess the diversity of goat grass found in the U.S. We have 30 accessions from the West. The idea being is to determine to what extent water is a limiting factor in the growth and reproduction of goat grass. If it is a significant factor, that limitation, then a transgene may have more significant impact than if water was not a big factor. Okay, so we did see big variation for many traits, uh, time to flowering, plant height, 
number of tillers, number of spike puts. So these traits that are very much related to reproductive fitness, that there was a, a big range among these accessions. Um, as well as we seeing differences among the accessions for sensitivity to water. Okay, so our results suggest that it would be hard to look at just one go-grass succession and make a conclusion about what is uh, the impact of the transgene, that the um, impact could be different in different parts of the country. In the Northwest, it could be different from the Great Plains. So I guess that's one of the bottom line messages. We weren't able to actually quantify an impact, but we were able to say that the impact would likely differ. OK, so this is a final thought. This is a new thought, at least new to me. Um, the idea that soil bacterial associations with plant roots could be influential in determining drought tolerance of a cultivar. Okay, typically, those of us here working for places like Icarsat, uh, plant breeders, and geneticists, we think of the plant, right? We don't think too much about uh, other organisms in the environment unless they cause disease. But, uh, you know, you think about the roots and, and uh, the diversity of microbial populations in the soil, there could be some important uh, interaction going on there. So the hypothesis, this, this was really developed by a soil microbiologist that I've started working with, is that a certain class of bacteria known as ACC plus, because they have an ACC deaminase enzyme that can break down the precursor of ethylene. Okay. Ethylene is something that will often induce senescence in plants. So breaking down that precursor reduces the amount of ethylene, causes greater root elongation for tapping the soil moisture more effectively. What this table shows is four varieties of roots um, under three different irrigation conditions, a dry land being the, dry, the driest. And the number here is the proportion, the percentage of culturable ACC plus bacteria relevant relative to all the culturable bacteria in the sample. So that the, for the full irrigation, there was no difference among the cultivars for limited, this cultivar Ron L was higher as, and in the dry land condition as well. So for the two limited moisture conditions, at least it looks like there is some indication of a difference among cultivars. And then um, root biologists got involved and collected root exudates under drought stress. Uh, this is, is looking at two cultivars. And she uh, divided these into three fractions. This is the polar fraction, um, the ethyl acetate extraction, and found that uh, the Ron L did have peaks in a couple of places that Ripper did not. OK, 
Okay. She then took this ethyl acetate extraction and amended soil, Colorado soil, with this fraction, uh, along with control, and found that doing that with the Ron L increased the percentage of this particular type of bacteria. So the implication then is that certain compounds in this ethyl acetate fraction of, of the root exudate will specifically recruit and uh, nourish the ACC plus bacteria. So a pretty interesting idea for me because I, this is the type of thing I've never thought of before, but it could open up new avenues. For example, if you could identify what these compounds are, if you could then find the gene in wheat that's responsible for the production, it could lead to a marker-assisted selection approach. Or another way of looking at that, this is inoculation, the way that seeds are inoculated with rhizobium bacteria. Perhaps there could be some inoculation strategy. Okay. Finally, I just wanted to uh, make a plug. This is a is a two week field course, which is capped by a, a two day symposium bringing lots of people from around the world. This summer, I think we had 15 students from 10 different countries. Um, it was really a lot of fun. And uh, uh, I think uh, all the students enjoyed and appreciated that. Our next one will be in June. Of of 2014, so it's something we do every two years. So I hope at some point some of you would be able to come or maybe suggest it to someone else. Next online course is uh, this coming fall. In any case, we found a big demand for this type of work that um, you all, in some way or another, involved with. And I know that your training is, is, uh, is also an important part of Icrosat's work. And I hope uh, maybe some, somehow we could collaborate together on this. Anyway, extremely important part of uh, uh, drug tolerance work is training the next generation. So I'd like to acknowledge collaboration. Collaborators of whom there are many, many. Steve Benzinger is the wheat breeder at uh, Nebraska. Scott Healy, the wheat breeder at Colorado. Uh, Bill Barley is a plant physiologist. Uh, Greg McMaster, a modeler, uh, and uh, several others. And then a whole series of grad students who've done different parts of this work. So. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.
wisp the soil microbiologist <laughs> into. Um, I'm not sure. Because the issue here would be uh, unless the substrate is present in soil, there is no way you know you can get uh, any reflection, even if the bacteria is present. Ethylene production is coming from the plant, or at least the, the ACC precursor is secreted from the plant leaves. So that would be the substrate for the contaminants that come from the plant. But as far as other things that um, the bacteria survive on, I know that there is a difference in locations, that some clean locations in our state seem to already have a good healthy population that is kind of stable. Others seem to be not. So we're trying to get a handle on how that is distributed. Because I, I work on Pearl Millet, and my you know, interest was to look at whether this concept can really work in uh, pearl millet growing ecology. And this crop uh, mostly is grown in very hot and arid uh, rural ecologies, uh -huh. wherein the soil moisture is really of very low state. Uh -huh. So we're just wondering if the population of you know this class of bacteria would be at a reasonably high level to be able to achieve this effect. Yes, and I don't know, I could... It's a nice presentation. Your breeding methods to improve the to uh, drought tolerance rate are very simple and just very user oriented. I'm just wondering, uh, you have used different methods like to improve the drought tolerance, like uh, collector and new collector, like collector ranking there. Just the genes for reducing the height and the soil microbes. Like the, the you you chose like different options, but uh, as you have mentioned in slides the wheat uh, the duration is like nine months especially when you're talking about the drought tolerance so the phenology like maturing maturity time also plays a very good role because the moisture is the big constraint there mm -hmm. so did you ever think about like uh, putting like developing early maturing varieties as a concept of improving the drought tolerance right and that's a very good thought um, we're really constrained in Colorado because if you move too early then the risk of frost. And because we are close to the mountains, we can get cold air moving through. Um, frost can be very damaging. And so the breeders over time have pretty much determined that if you, you know, somewhere around May 20th to 25th is where wheat should flower. If you get down to, you know, a week before that, then the risk of frost increases. Now, this could change with climate change, right? Because if the, um, you know, the, our, our growing season is extended, and if our springs come earlier, then maybe we could move earlier. But it would still be a risky thing because, you know, part of climate change is extreme events. So even though the average date of flowering, or, or the average date of last frost would move earlier, you could still have recurrences. So anyway, it's basically um, trying to find the right balance between avoiding the frost and avoiding the terminal drought impacts. Trying to find exactly the right spot. Just one more thing. Yeah. Uh, in your variety and synthetic trial, mentioning in your results that the uh, yield advantage was more in uh, dry treatment. So can you elaborate that thing? Well, um, you know, I, I showed um, also some of the wheat tea studies, and at least one of the families that gave the best response under drought also had 
uh, longest for people to use. So that could be a factor. It's something that uh, the people at Simmons have published on, they particularly found one of the advantages of this competitiveness is um, tapping into future research programs. So that's one um, possible conclusion. But it doesn't Hatcher is already completed the first four corners. Um, one big difference between those two categories, and the reason we chose them was to be distinct for the semi-dwarfing groups. So, semi-dwarfing. Bridge Street does not have any of these to uh, the synthetic manufacturer. I'm not sure. It could be something not in the Yeah. We are, are one of the next steps of the project that I didn't mention is to uh, do some GDS genotyping to see specifically what regions of the synthetic were retained in the best performance. So maybe that will offer some insight. Hmm. Yeah, there's a word for it. Well, where the data is used to build the surface, they built the job to the machine, and that's what the world will use it. Right, right. Uh, but the One way to answer your question is it depends on the environment, but <laughs> there's a clear answer. Yes. Um, right, right. Yeah. And there were two parts of this experiment, and perhaps it was kind of confused. But one part was looking at wheat to wheat gene flow, because that could uh, affect commercial markets uh, if you have a transfer. And in, for wheat to wheat, we found gene flow out to, I think, uh, 80, 70 or 80 meters, so farther than is generally thought to occur in wheat. For the goat grass that I saw, all those numbers on cross-pollination were side by side. Okay, so, and, and that is the way that goat grass occurs, is for the most part right inside wheat fields. Okay, so that situation would be very realistic. I believe we got some cross-pollination with goat grass up to about 10 meters away, but that was a very small minority. It was mostly, we only saw it in the side-by-side. -side. Yes, it's all, all uh, wind pollen.
low R squared values. You know, those were for uh, precipitate. So, you know, I think when those are all added together, that the moisture becomes the dominant factor year to year. Um, wheat is very well adapted. many times during that cycle and use it to its advantage to get a decent yield. Uh, soil fertility, uh, you're getting into areas beyond um, expertise that I should uh, become better at, educated about. Um, certainly we see it may be practiced by from about a third of the area. And we see that there are 